So introduction here for North House. My name is Sarah. I am a program manager here at North House. We are located on the North shore of Lake Superior and uh, in Grand Marais, a small town up here. And um, we always like to talk about the weather when we start our webinars. So we are wrapping up a, kind of a mixed cloudy day. We saw peaks of sunshine, but it's definitely pretty gloomy looking right now. And we're warming up here. We haven't seen any new snow for a while. So I bet we'll get another couple of bouts in the next few weeks. So get a little refresher for some late season skiing. So hopefully all your weather is okay where you are. And um, I'll answer that closed caption question in just a second. Thanks for asking. You don't have it set up um, right this moment, but I'll get it set up once uh, the, the presentation gets going. Thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Sorry about the delay in that. Uh, so just a, just a quick Zoom tour for everybody uh, in our webinars. We really appreciate if you ask our questions through the Q&A function. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, two little you know, chat bubbles is what I would call them. And we really appreciate uh, questions going in there instead of the chat function. Sometimes there's so many comments coming through the chat that we might lose a question in there. So it's if you want to have the best chance to get your question answered, we uh, really appreciate your questions going in the Q&A function. And um, looking at my notes here, I just wanted to share if you want to learn more about North House. Uh, I know a bunch of you maybe just signed up for our Inu Suda poll, but if you want to check out our website at north, northhouse.org, it's a great way to learn about all of our uh, upcoming events and, of course, all of our uh, courses. And we just released uh, a lot of new courses uh, through the end of the year. Uh, so check out um, the course tab at the top of the home page. Okay. And, um, and about this webinar, we are actually in the middle of Wood Week right now. So we have these wonderful special webinars going on throughout the month of March. And we're so excited to welcome our friends from the Maine Coast Craft School tonight. And tomorrow night, uh, we will welcome Jeff Bierce, who's gonna be talking about Japanese carpentry. So feel free to tune back in for that webinar as well. And then on March 25th, we'll be welcoming Magnus Sundeling from Sweden, and he'll be talking about his journey in green woodworking. We've got a bunch of events going on on campus, so if you're nearby, we've got a lot of free programs going on, especially tomorrow, which is our Carvers Conference Day, where we take a break, and we have a bunch of demos, and we do some webinar watch parties, and we also have a featured presentation with Mary May, who is uh, in town teaching from South Carolina. So we'll see a demo from Mary and also a presentation. So the demo will be at 1.30 and the presentation at seven. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pass this mic off to Nate White, who is in our artisan development program. So he's a re resident artisan and uh, we're really happy to have him here uh, as our, um, our official webinar host. I'm just the, the introductory person. So I'm going to disappear here and let, let, let Nate take over, excuse me, and then I'll get those um, captions started too. So thanks for that and thank you, Nate. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm over here at North House in our green building in front of the Wall of Craft. We have a new addition for North House's Jubilee, 25 years of the queen coming over and everything. Um, I am in ADP, the Artist and Development Program at North House. If you're checking out the courses, you can also check out um, the Artist and Development Program. It is a two-year residency. If you know anyone who is, I guess, beyond emerging artist, I think they asked for four years of experience, but I just started in September. It's a great program. You get to connect with the broader North House community, work with a lot of great people, work with North House. You have your own studio space. Um, and the application is open until the end of the month. So pass that along to anyone you know who might be curious. Um, 
And I guess segueing into that, um, getting to work with great people. I just recently got back from a trip to Maine where I was working with Kenneth and checking out uh, the Maine Coast Craft School. Um, Kenneth and I first worked together 10 years ago when I first got into woodworking at the Carpenter's Boat Shop, uh, which is just up the road from the Maine Coast Craft School. Um, Kenneth has worked with a lot of interesting people um, John Brown, Bill Copperplate, uh, Drew Langsner at Country Workshops, and him and Angela have just started the Maine Coast Craft School. It's, how old is it now, you guys? Is it Six four years. years? Six years. Six years, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, well, yeah, with that, um, I'll let you guys take it away. Um, Kenneth and Angela Kortmeyer of Maine Coast Craft School. All right. Thank you, Nate. I um, appreciate that um, introduction. I'm Angela. I'm Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm going to share our screen and we're going to show you some. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank, thanks to uh, Nate and Sarah and the North House Folk School for having us on here for our, uh, our second Zoom meeting. So we're excited about second this. Second Zoom meeting ever in our <laughs> lives. Um, How's that looking? Can everyone see? Okay, it's good. Nate says it's good. Okay, yeah, so uh, we're so honored to have been um, included and uh, we're uh, excited to welcome you to uh, the coast of Maine where we live. Uh, this is the place that the, the, the Wabanaki call the Dawn Land because we are the first to see the sun every morning. Uh, it's a really magical place. We live on the Pemaquid Peninsula. Um, we're close to the ocean on several sides, but we actually live in a really wooded, uh, deeply wooded um, part of, of the peninsula. Um, and it's a, it's a really remarkable setting for a Greenwood craft school. Um, uh, we uh, are just, we're surrounded by the ocean, but we're also, we have a lot of fresh water. So just down the hill from our school and our house is a, it's a lake. It's, a, it's actually a wide place in the Pemaquid River. And we, we, I'm just gonna introduce you to where we live. So there's the pond. Um, we go ice skating there. We go canoeing and kayaking and there are, bald eagles and river otter and salamanders and bobcats. Um, we, we really live in a, a little wilderness here and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous little bubble of, um, of nature, even though it's, it's, you know, we're 15 minutes from the closest town this is another picture of Boyd's Pond and it really, it's really a magical place. So you can see that from the photographs. Um, I, can't, I can't stress how magical it is. I, I know I've said that twice or three times now, but this little bubble where we live is, um, yeah, especially in these wacky times that we've been through the you know past handful of years, and especially with the the pandemic, et cetera, we um, we have felt really protected, and um, part of that is because we've really designed our home and our lifestyle to be uh, self sufficient. Um, yeah, years ago. I mean, we've been working on our homestead for what, 15 years. Mm -hmm. These are photographs of our house, which um, I designed the house and Kenneth and Nate and I and many other people have helped us to build. Um, you can see it's long and skinny. Oh, look at that. That's how I designed the house. I used Legos um, and drawing and and many other ways, but really we totally designed it. It's all built by hand and it fits us like a glove. Um, 
And you all know from the title of this that we live off the grid. So this is an old photograph, probably from 2013 or something. You can see our solar panels, our wood piles, our water catchment. Um, people often ask us, you know, what our systems are like, and they're they're really straightforward. So here's here's Kenneth um, working on our hand dug well. We took two stainless steel barrels and had them um, had them welded, welded together uh, end to end and put it in the hole. We, we we live on a ledge, and so it wouldn't go down very far, but you can see in there. So inside, this is inside the house now. And so we have a hand pump inside and we pump water from the well into this cistern inside the house, another stainless steel 50 gallon barrel. So we have to fill that every, I don't Three know. Weeks. No, every week and a half. Um, this is another big part of our system of living uh, self-sufficiently. We uh, heat everything with wood that we, split and stack ourselves. We really like these round um, wood, wood piles. Um, we go through maybe two a year for our house. Um, and um, yeah, this is, this is another essential part of our, our system. This is our little tiny sauna um, that some friends of ours built. Um, so we, we haul a lot of wood and we haul a lot of water. Um, this is the inside of the sauna um, and you heat it up and you can take a bath even if it's snowy and icy outside or especially if it's snowy and icy outside. But um, um, yeah, so so hauling wood and water is, is basically, it really comes down to that. And a lot of people seem to think that is no way to live, but we really love it. Um, we, we learned from this man here, this is Bill Copperthwaite. He is, um, he was a friend of ours. He's passed away now, but he built these beautiful structures um, up down East Maine. Um, there's our cat with, um, with Bill's yurt where he lived for, I don't know how many years. Um, but Bill, the first time I went and visited Bill with Kenneth at this year, there's Bill and Kenneth together. Um, he had us hauling these, these eight by four foot sheets of tempered glass um, with these straps. It was a really, I didn't realize this was gonna be, see those, see those big um, pieces of glass behind the people who are sitting there carving? Yeah, we were carrying those with a, with a strap on our shoulders. Um, yeah, there's there. I didn't realize how much of a a thing it was, and how much um, it would impact me. So, this is his cashier. This is his storage unit, um, kind of um, at his house. And uh, so, Bill, not just about he wasn't just about carrying things. He was about really beautifully, um, beautifully handcrafted. Uh, gorgeous spaces. Um, we learned a lot from Bill uh, in terms of aesthetics. Now, this is a building, our most recent building, and um, he, he kind of only built round buildings. We, we don't only do round ones, but we definitely um, think of him often and uh, as we're carrying things. Um, but also as we're designing our, our buildings, like we really believe that the things that we're making um, need to be beautiful. And um, we like them to be um, biodegradable. <laughs> this, is, this is another teacher, um, quick transition here. Uh, Drew and Louise Langsner, Nate mentioned them, um, taught us a lot about having a family, um, a family business, a craft school. So we pretty much inherited our craft school from Drew and Louise. I learned a lot about hospitality from Louise. She and I both do all the cooking for our craft schools. Kenneth learned a lot of crafts from, from Drew. Um, I've learned a lot from him about uh, tools. We, he, um, 
he gave us the contacts for his uh, tool sales business. Um, Drew was the one who uh, forged, <laughs> forged relationships with some Swedish craftspeople, uh, Hans Carlson, most notably. Um, we, we still are selling Hans Carlson tools. Uh, Elsa and Svante Jarva are uh, other contacts from Drew and Louise. Um, we still sell their tools. We have, um, we're so fortunate uh, to be selling these wonderful tools. It got us through the, the pandemic. We had to um, cancel all of our classes, um, but we were still selling tools. Um, this is a photograph of Julia Kaltoff and her wonderful axe. And there in the green t-shirt is Lucian Avery. He's a uh, Vermont blacksmith. So we've, um, yeah, it's a class that he was teaching at our school in 2021 20, this last year. We've expanded just slightly. These are some of his bowl bottom gouges. So, so that's one big part of our, our business, but it's really small. I mean, we get 10 axes from each of our makers a year um, and we don't expect it's gonna go up uh, beyond that. So here is um, a slide of a group of people at the Carpenter's Boat Shop. Um, you can see I look kind of chubby there because I was pregnant um, with um, our son. Oh, this is going fast. Anyway, Carpenter's Boat Shop. I learned a lot about hospitality. These are some salads I made this past summer. Um, Carpenter's Boat Shop, I was the house mom and I learned to cook there and to teach other people to cook and um, you know how to, how to live in community. Um, Everybody was welcome. Everybody just would come in and sit down and we'd have 25 people at the dinner table every day. And um, we, we do that, we carry that on at the, at, the, at the craft school here. So this is a transition from our teachers. Here's our new sticker. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, this is our school now. So we're in our sixth year. And this is a uh, make a chair from a tree class. And this is the entire student body. Um, so we have five students in at the most in every class. And I would say that that is probably the most um, important aspect of, you know, of the structure of the school for me, that our classes are really human scaled. Um, they're human scaled in terms of the number of people, but also in terms of the hand tools that are used. Um, we sometimes, Kenneth sometimes uses power tools, but generally not during a class. Um, really 90% of what we do is, is hand tool work. And um, um, where was I? Oh yeah. So I'm. these slides are showing you a kind of the, some of the variety of classes that, that we offer. So this was a timber framing class that we had this past summer, 2021. Uh, before that was a Welsh Windsor class. This is a, uh, a knife making class. You can kind of see the blade back in there. Um, it's a stacked birch bark uh, knife handle. Um, um, so, a huge variety of classes. Um, again, this is the this is the group, um, five students and Kenneth, so that um, he really does have the ability to connect with all of them, and um, it's really the best educational experience that I can think of. Um, and our plan is to maintain that. We're not planning on expanding. Uh, having, we're not going to have larger classes. Oh, look who's that. There's our friend, Nate, <laughs> who in 27, 16 or 17 came and helped us. So um, our classes are small, but I have to say that our community is um, so full of different people. Um, Nate, yeah, like everything we do, I mean, you can imagine since we move a lot of stuff by hand, we need, we need a lot of hands. And um, so these are just some images showing a tiny, tiny 
bit of you know our community um they always seem to think it's it's really fun so <laughs> this is this is an image of the timber framing uh, the timber frame raising for the school um again this was in 2017 the year that we first started having classes i think uh uh, it was a it was a crazy year. I can't believe we did it. We would have a week of class and then we would work on the building for a week. Uh, and the whole summer was like that. Um, I was a little nervous that our students would would find it really distracting, but they all seemed to love it. Um, but as you can see from from these all these construction images, we really do build all of our buildings. Um, ourselves by hand. Um, and uh, we also teach people as we're doing that. So up there in the blue shirt is our friend Eric, who was an intern with us. There's a school like these days. That's, that's pretty much what it looks like right now. Um, um, so yeah, I was talking about our interns. So we have, in every class, we have four paying students, and then we have a, a spot for an intern, somebody who um, couldn't necessarily afford the uh, tuition for all those classes. Um, so they come early in the season, in the spring. Our new intern is coming this weekend. This is, this is an intern, Austin. The previous image was um, Koala and Austin. Um, we're on six or seven or eight intern now. And, in terms of how many um, people have come to help us. So, so they come early and they help us with buildings and grounds and set up for classes. But then in exchange, they um, have a place to stay. We, we, tr we feed them as best we can and they, um, they get to take all the classes. Here's an image from 2020, September, 2020. Uh, the, the timber frame raising from our most recent uh, building. Uh, up there's Eric again, uh, one of our previous interns who uh, came back to help with, um, he's a climber. So he, um, he was helping frame out that, that roof. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we couldn't do it without our interns for sure. And um, we do our best to teach them <laughs> all kinds of crazy stuff um, that hopefully will uh, benefit them in the future. Um, we, um, we think that uh, handcrafts, handmade things. Oh, look, there's my Lego model again. So that's, that's the Lego model that I made for the uh, most recent building which is huh which is our kitchen and office for angela yeah, yeah. upstairs oh uh, so there you see they really do look just the same <laughs> um yeah so that's the bulk of 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 what i wanted to say um there's a few more there's there's the interior of the uh new kitchen building from the summer um uh yeah, I make I make lunches for students. Uh, it's it's not a commercial kitchen, but oh, now this shows you some of our interns. Um, for for me, um, the intern position is is really where it's at. Um, we're so excited to see so many of these interns take it further. Um, they are going out into the world and, and taking the things that they learned from us into new places, making chairs, um, starting their own businesses, selling crafts. Here's another intern, Emily. Um, yeah, we make them carry stuff all the time. <laughs> but it's important, it's pro important for us to teach people how to um, carry stuff. This is a great Howard Zinn quote that I got yesterday. The future is an infinite succession of presents and to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad in the world. I can't remember the rest. Okay, 
Here is a slide that shows you some of our contact information. We'll show it again at the end of the presentation um, if you don't get all this information. So this is also uh, the translation point for Kenneth. Can we? Yeah, just pause it. See if you can pause it just for a second. Kenneth asked can me to even, pause that. Does that thing, can that go away, that black streak? streak thing? Great. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, we're just going to pause this for a second because the uh, the slide shows on a timer for the transitions between. And uh, I we just wanted to just take a second to, um, yeah, thank you, Angela. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk now a bit more about the, uh, the classes in particular and um, more focused just on the school where Angela is wanted to just set the tone of the school and uh, our off-grid lifestyle and off-grid uh, school building. Um, so uh, this, uh, as Angela mentioned, we live near the Pimaquid River, which uh, it has a wide spot called the um, Boyd Pond. And uh, there's it's a lovely mix of hard and softwood. So most of the materials that I need for the green woodworking classes come from within a few miles of the school. Sometimes we can start the class with a little walk in the forest and find uh, the spoon crooks or uh, wall hooks or things that we might need for the for the actual class. I try to connect people with the uh, material and the, the project so that they um, leave definitely knowing that what they've made came from a tree. Um, and uh, again, this is some birch that we um, got for bowl carving. It turned out to be a little too big for the uh, student bowl carving class, but that was one that Nate had made his bowl from when he was here last week. Uh, but we do do a lot of the, we start directly, we split wood um, into parts that we're gonna need is usually one of the first steps. I'm gonna look at my little notes here for a second. Um, we also use froze. This is Will using a fro to split some red oak and a, and a break here. He's splitting out parts for a ladder back chair. Um, he came and worked with me a few years ago. Um, sometimes we actually split wood um, down to very fine parts, especially when we're doing um, smaller items like the rim for a basket. Um, that might be what this is that I'm kind of working apart with my knife in the way you would a fro. Uh, here is a person starting on a bowl, cutting some of the fibers apart after we've split this birch that will become a, um, a bowl for the class. Uh, I can see that's one of our first classes because there were no walls yet. Um, and then we have sometimes we use an, uh, lift ads to help shape bowls. It's, this is something I'm working on in the wintertime, of course, here to uh, roughly shape the surface of a, a, a bowl blank. And here's a student uh, splitting out an apple crook for a spoon carving class with a fro. Um, and we had taken a walk to find this right before this happened. So they got to see um, it as part of the tree. And on that same tree, it was a apple tree that had blown over. We found this lovely uh, crook for a much larger ladle that one of the more ambitious students was able to complete during the class. So we're using wedges to split this apart. Sometimes we've done basket making classes. So this is some black ash that we're pounding actually to um, separate the growth rings and taking those fibers, the growth ring strips off, and um, we'll use those in our basket making classes that we teach. Um, so sometimes basket making for me is one of the, it's like almost the essence of green woodworking because you're really working down with the, the actual fibers and the, um, the essential elements of the ash tree that way. So here's some images of uh, some of the baskets we made during that time. That was a couple twice. Carrie Lambertson came out twice and from Minnesota actually and did this class with us making these market baskets. Um, so the first year's class, we had only a canvas tarp, um, which you can see there on the roof. We had no walls. Um, although some liked the ease of sweeping up at the end of the day, uh, and it was quite nice having all that light, it was a bit of a 
when the wind and the rain came, I had to be a little bit more careful with my tools, but we now have the school sheathed in. I still have plastic on the windows. I'm hoping by this summer, we're actually gonna have wooden windows. Um, I'm, I'm working on the casements for these antique wooden sash that I have to go in there. Um, but we're having lots of windows still so that we can have as much natural light as possible, like here with this late afternoon sun that we get every day, which is just lovely to work on. Um, and in. Um, because we run classes only in the summer, the rest of the year is available for other projects, um, such as running this uh, sawmill, sawmill that we have. We have a wood miser that we can saw materials for classes is mostly what I do. So here I'm sawing a pine log for some nice boards. Here I am uh, putting some linseed oil on our house, you know, so there's always um, stuff to keep us busy. Um, I also continue to build out the infrastructure of our house and home. Here I am doing one of my favorite things, uh, shingling with a friend upon some staging on our house here. Um, but we also spend the winters exploring personal projects too and uh, things that we're personally interested in. So um, I love wheelbarrows. Um, and so rather than having... Uh, pavement or roads to allow access for tractors or vehicles around our property. We rely on our fleet of homemade wheelbarrows. And um, through Bill Copperthwaite's example, you can see him here with me. We're uh, working on a wheelbarrow together, one of his designs. But I learned how useful and fun a well-designed wheelbarrow can be. Um, Bill taught me about using a shoulder strap uh, on the handles there. He actually learned that from the ancient Chinese uh, wheelbarrows, but having that shoulder strap and then the one across the pelvis really helps a lot. And having the large bicycle wheel on the front, you can really um, get over difficult terrain. Here's one that I use for really heavy things based on a Chinese bricklayer's wheelbarrow where the weight is balanced around either side of the axle of the wheel. You can see it just peeking, peeking out there. And then they're also great as a chair when you need to take a little break, just have a little wheelbarrow lounge chair there to, to kick back in. Um, so speaking of Bill, um, we teach a class on simple, accessible furniture designs that were inspired by Bill. And one of the designs is this chair here. I call it the triangle chair. I don't know that Bill actually ever had a name for it. Um, all the shaping is done with a draw knife and spoke shaves and scorps and some gouge work. Um, but you can see the unpainted chair is, you can see how it's just flat boards and they're screwed together. Um, he had three or four different designs in this vein of work. And um, so we um, also, another one of his designs are these benches, these four board benches. And you can see in this picture, all of the um, tools that are needed to complete this, uh, this bench. So we've done those in the past as well. Uh, now, spoons are one of my favorite handcrafts. Um, it's a very popular class and a very popular craft activity these days. Um, there's much to learn that's packed into this deceptively simple package with the spoon carving. I like to break down spoon carving into uh, teachable methodology methods. So here you can see I've laid lines on this spoon blank to uh, show where the chamfers are going to be and where to cut and where not to cut. So we break it down um, for people. There are many tools and techniques needed to be understood in order to pursue this enriching handcraft. So we teach a very comprehensive class. I think it's, uh, is it seven days now? I think it's six. Six days, it's okay. Done, yeah. So we do a, we do a full- um, Spoon carving intensive. Spoon carving it. intensive. So here's some pictures from our bowl carving class that we do. Um, these we take a half, usually a white birch log, we split it in half, and then people can design the shape of the, the cavity, I guess, of the bowl. Here's a student um, working with a dog leg gouge to um, shape the sides and bottom of, of his bowl. Um, and here's a student working on the outside of the bowl and a bowl horse with a draw knife, it looks like. Um, working on the outer outside. So there's a variety of tools with bowls as well that, and different ways of holding the work while you're working on it. Um, here's some people using a draw, knife, a draw knife on a shave horse and a maybe a little bit of an ax work going on. Um, so 
This is another one of our popular classes that we teach. We try to leave where we hope that students leave with all of the skills and confidence to keep practicing when they get home. Now, this is a, a bowl that um, Nate will recognize because this is the one I worked on last uh, week or so ago, or maybe it's two weeks now ago when Nate was with us or with us here. It's a cherry bowl, quite large. It's about two feet long and maybe, um, I don't know, 18 inches across. And uh, I was having fun with these uh, grip designs with these two holes here. I'm looking forward to making salads yes. in it this summer. <laughs> so um, in all our classes, we provide all the tools and materials needed, and we hope to offer students top quality, sharp tools to learn on. Now, chairs are another thing that we teach. Um, like all the things that we teach, chairs are lovely things to make and to use in one's home. Um, since we don't have electricity at our school, all of our chair designs we offer um, do not require the use of a power lathe to make their parts. Um, all of the parts in our chairs are, can you pause it? All the parts in our chairs are whittled or shaved by hand using a draw knife and spoke shave. This limits the styles of the chairs we can teach. Um, and I had Angela pause this because I, um, this was Curtis Buchanan's class and you can actually one of the <laughs> students is quite uh, excited about his chair there in the middle, uh, Joshua, but um, so a few years ago, Curtis Buchanan uh, invited me down to Tennessee to learn to build his, uh, what he calls a democratic chair or democratic Windsor. And uh, that's what this class is. And he was thinking in inviting me down that it would be a great fit for our school with its non-electric chair making. And although it is uh, the most elaborate and technically advanced chair design that we offer, for those inspired to try it, it has indeed been a great addition to our chair class offerings. And we're very grateful just to, uh, we're to Curtis for that. Yeah, this will be our second year um, doing that. Um, so there's, they can be finished in different ways as well. Here's one. So now these are another style that we offer. This is a, a vernacular Windsor based, inspired by the Welsh Windsors. Um, and this as uh, Nate had mentioned, the late John Brown, um, who I was fortunate enough to apprentice with back in uh, 1997. He uh, taught me this form of chair making and um, I actually might have to have you pause it again when it gets to the next image. Um, okay. Oh yeah, okay, well, one more. So here I am showing Randall. showing Randall, showing, <laughs> I'm showing Randall how to lay out the crest of his chair. Um, but, I, um, but I'm drawn to this chair design because of it's so accessible and has all of these sculptural qualities uh, as I'm teaching it. Yeah, pause it there. So as I'm um, teaching it, there's actually many um, points along the way where students can, um, I guess there's areas for self-expression. You know, they could change the curve of this or the spacing of the spindles. We're not building it to a set of plans. Oh, it didn't pause. Um, yeah, so, um, and that would have appealed to John Brown. He really um, prided himself on not using plans to make chairs. He um, would, would be very proud that his chairs were each individual chairs. They were more akin to sculpture to him than to a chair based on a certain pattern. Uh, unlike Curtis's chair, Democratic Windsor class, we are building a reproduction of the design that Curtis um, designed. And it is a lovely design. This class and then our ladder back class, they're more of a vernacular chair making where it's more like folk art, really. Each chair can be whatever it wants to be. Uh, I make suggestions about leg angles and rake and splay and um, whatnot. And, um, but there's a few areas where um, students can make their own choices about things uh, with these. So um, I'm grateful for um, John Brown inspiring me with um, to make and continue teaching these chairs. Um, he's, uh, he's been in the news often recently. Um, so uh, there's our little tribute to John. Um, so ladder back chair making, I um, learned while I was interning with Drew Langsner, who learned this form of chair making from Jenny Alexander down at Country Workshops is where we did this. Um, and I've been inspired to teach this form of chair making ever since 2003 when I came to teach at the Carpenter's Boat Shop. I taught it there for 10 years with the apprentices. Uh, I'm sure Nate uh, got to make one while he was there, I think. 
Um, but we like it because it introduces people to core green woodworking chair skills, chair making skills like draw knife work, shaping things by eye. Um, the techniques and tools that we use in the ladder rack chairs are used in all of our classes and all of our chair making. Uh, we do start, this is our make a chair from a tree class. So we do start with uh, actual log and we um, rive out the pieces and um, shape them. There's Amy Umble working on the front post of their chair. Um, so it's very accessible to beginners and it's adaptable, excuse me, it's adaptable to many design variations. Here's one I did with a caned seat that was inspired by a, a historic photo I saw of a shaker chair. They had done that. And here's some where I took that basic design and expanded the uh, side rungs a bit and then uh, mortised in some um, rockers, some bent rockers and um, was making, made a red oak and an ash uh, ladder back. So here's basket making. Uh, this was from the class Carrie came to. I'm just helping a student shape a handle here. Um, so we have done that occasionally. We we're, we're um, we love this form of green woodworking. Now here's a, a picture from a scribe rule timber framing class we did last summer with uh, Austin and uh, Andrew was teaching the class. You can see these beams are quite curved. So it was a crook frame that we designed and assembled. And it, we did all the layout of the jointry with something called scribe rule using plumb bobs and dividers primarily. It's a very ancient form of um, layout for timber timber framing. So we were excited to have that class. And here's our spring pole lathe class, which we've done one time. Well, once we had two spring pole class class, but this one, um, Oliver Pratt, Oliver Pratt joined me and I taught people how to make these lathes and then for the first half of the class. And then Oliver for the second half taught people how to use them. I think it was a seven or eight day class, wasn't it? It was yeah. quite a- And then they took the lathes home with them. And then thankfully they took those large <laughs> lathes home with them because <laughs> we could have never held them. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a fun class we tried. And then here's um, some pictures from a, um, a Greenwood day camp we did for some local youth. So here they are, looks like they have some striped maple there getting ready to uh, make some wall hooks. We did some simple uh, birch bark containers, getting ready to put some pins in on this uh, this rim here. It looks like uh, with Brody, um, but all these uh, boys have have all um, aged out now, <laughs> and so uh, we haven't offered that again. But uh, that was a fun time for them and for me, uh, making all these little greenwood uh, projects with them. Um, recently, we've decided to. Um, start teaching broom making and including a sheet metal dustpan making. So here's the sheet metal dustpan that I was inspired by. This design actually was inspired again by um, one of Bill Copperthwaite's designs. So um, that was a fun aspect of that class. Here's the uh, brooms that people had woven and uh, getting ready to, to stitch with the, uh, the clamps there on them I see and they've chosen their uh, handle material and um, here's the class. They all got to try different. I think this was a four day class or five, four day, four day. And they got to um, make a variety of brooms and dust pans and people, some people had different handles and uh, Austin put a copper band on his. And then, uh, so here's Angela. She uh, carrying some stuff, carrying some stuff with our yoke and our uh, firewood carriers. And uh she and I are, you know, although she doesn't get the spotlight as much as I do when the classes are happening, um, she and I are, uh, I'm, I'm very blessed to have her as a partner in the business and as a wife. Um, and here's, here we are on Boyd Pond again with our, our late dog, Georgie, who uh, unfortunately passed away um, this past winter. So there's our, um, I'm going to pause this. There's our, um, our website, the Main Coast Craft, and our email, and our even our Instagram. So, um, if anybody's interested in, in in checking out more, learning more about us, that's where you can do that and sign up for classes. And we do. And Angela does, um, as she mentioned, um, we have some specialized woodworking tools as well for sale on there. So that's um, that's about it. Thank you for your time. We're gonna.
take some questions, I think, now that maybe uh, people have asked, right, Nate? I'll turn it back over to Yeah, from, if anyone has any questions, um, again, send them into the Q&A section. We only have one right now, and it's from Jenny Monfor. And she hey, was Jenny. curious about, uh, she's curious about the kind of pump you guys have. The hand pump? It's called a bison hand pump, and um, they make four or five models. They have a deep well, yeah, depending on how deep of a well you have. Um, it, they used to be made here in Maine, but um, I think the quality is still just as good, but the company was sold to a, out to a company in Arizona, uh, but you can find them online under bison pump, and I, I haven't looked at the new, I think the new company may have even expanded the offerings a little bit, but you have to call them and tell them, you know, how far the water's coming and how high it has to be drawn up. And they'll tell you which pump um, is appropriate. So, but it's a great pump. It's the very best that we yeah. have tried. Yeah. And they're rebuildable and it's all brass and uh, stainless steel. Stainless. So they're made to, to be very durable. Yeah. Um, Kenneth, one of the questions I had was you mentioned, I mean, you both mentioned having all the interns and stuff and, um, I don't know if I count as an intern for you guys, but yes, you know, you like do. getting, getting some of those <laughs> first opportunities for people in craft can be so huge. And especially, you know, at the carpenter's boat shop and stuff, you can meet a lot of people and get connections like that. And I was just curious, um, well, a, you, you're coming from, you came from kind of like a fine art background at the Atlanta college of art. What first got you into craft? Do you remember like the first thing that you saw that you wanted to try and make? Um, and then do you remember kind of like your first person that kind of took you under their wing and like, what was, who was the, like your first person that kind of taught you some sort of craft yeah. skill or something? Well, uh, well, both Angela and I have a fine arts background um, and we met at the Atlanta College of Art. Angela went on and got her master's. I only have a bachelor's. But when I was, um, and we both actually worked in the wood shop together <laughs> in, 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 at the Atlanta College of Art. But to answer your question, I was, uh, I was in the Atlanta College of Art. I, got, I was really drawn to the wood shop. The wood shop, though, had a very strong focus on power tools. Um, which I was excited to learn, but I and I and and I did, but there were there were very few. There might have been one block plane or something. It was just very limited hand tools. So there was one other student who uh, showed me a, a cabinet scraper. I remember um, Chester. Chester. Chester Burton. Burton yeah, mm -hmm. but I I was seeing objects over in the. Um, in the collections of the High Museum of Art, they had a lot of these uh, mostly African carvings of masks and other objects. And they had this texture to the surface that I, I knew they hadn't used power tools, but I didn't really understand how they were made. So I started to um, try to find people who, um, who understood about hand tools. So actually the first things I would do, I started just looking through issues of fine woodworking magazine and finding stuff there. And I learned about, I remember I learned about a draw knife. So I started uh, the first objects I made when I was in college, you really were discouraged to make things that were functional. So I, I was thinking more of wood, wood and woodworking and hand tools is how to create textures on, on surfaces of wood that met my aesthetic goals. On non-functional things. On non-functional things. <laughs> <laughs> so they were, um, the first things I was drawn to make were these, I think I, I titled them all unknown apparatus and they were mostly wall hangings. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked like they were functional things, but they were totally unfunction, not functional, but they had the aesthetic of a tool or a, some sort of uh, implement that had seen a lot of use. Those were the kinds of things I was first drawn to make. It was more, I was just drawn to this uh, aesthetic, but I was in this, um, being an art school, I had to meet the criteria of, this, of the sculpture faculty who really just, they didn't want us to do anything to do with craft. They would have failed him. They would have failed. And Craig McClure, I think was your first 
mentor. Yeah, in that. McClure was my yeah. first. He was the woodshop master. And, um, well, when I got out of, um, when I graduated from the Atlanta College of Art, I knew that I wanted to study handcrafts. And so I moved to Asheville and then eventually found country workshops. Um, so that was a real, um, real fortunate turn of events that I wound up there as their summer intern. Yeah. Um, we got a couple of questions coming in. Um, Randall Leeser is curious if you have a knife class coming up soon. No. No. Not, not for not 2022. Soon. Maybe next year. We're going to work with, with Lucian. He'll be back. Yeah, Lucian couldn't make it. We wanted to do a longer knife making class with Lucian this summer. We will. Um, but it didn't work out for Lucian, unfortunately. And then anonymous attendee is curious, are, what are the preferred woods to use for spoons and bowls? Oh, goodness. The preferred wood. <laughs> well, for the, well, I can answer this. One. Yes, for, you can. So for the, um, in the classes for people just starting out, I want something that's soft for them to carve, but not so soft that it can't take edges and um, form the sort of shapes they want. So white birch is usually my go-to wood around here, white birch or red maple or um, yeah, mostly white birch and red maple. Now for my own personal things, like you saw, I had that cherry uh, bowl and um, so cherry, apple, even lilac are some of the woods I like for um, spoons, my personal spoons. I like really the more, um, they're still green, but I like them to be quite hard because of the types of, and the thinness I wanna have in the spoons that I do personally. But for classes, it's the birch, but actually you saw in that one class, you know, when we do those comprehensive classes, I'll have them practice on birch, but then their, their final spoon will be a crook of apple or, or whatever, you know, something like that, or yellow birch, something harder so that they can experience that. So I think it's more, once you have some experience under your belt, so to say, so to say, um, I think going with a, a harder, one of the harder woods like yellow birch or apple or cherry or, you know, depending on where you are. Now I'm talking about woods around us here now. Real tight grain. Yeah. yeah. I feel like any tight grain hardwood. Yep. And then if you can find something that fruits or flowers, that's yep. a bonus. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then also from anonymous attendee or maybe a different anonymous attendee, what tools would be a starting kit for spoons and bowl carving? Well, if you ask Peter Follinsby, it's just three, three tools. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for, for spoons and bowls, well, I think I could, well, I'll, I'll answer those separately. So for spoons, um, yeah, this is a hard question to answer, I guess, cause you could do them a lot of different ways. I mean, you could just have uh, some way, if you, if you wanted to um, just have a, let me think, <laughs> having some sort of straight Sloyd knife is really, really helpful. A thin bladed, you know, a Sloyd knife that's not real wide that you can get into some of the tight concave cavities that you have. So a, a nice, like a frost, a Mora 106 is fine or, or one of the fancier knives if you want. Um, and having it be sharp is really important. Um, I think having some way to cut the wood to length, either a saw or pruning shears is really helpful. Um, if you have some way to um, split the wood, you could, you could you know, you take a, an ax or a, a small hatchet that you hit with a, a baton, or if you wanted to have a, you know, a more specialized fro that could work too. There's a lot of ways that you could split the wood, even a, like a machete or something could work, I suppose. Um, and then I, you know, if you start with small diameter wood, that's not too large, you could probably avoid the whole roughing it out with an ax, uh, which is another complication. So I would say just a knife and some way to cut the wood to start. And then for the concave bowl part, if you want to do that, uh, you can use a gouge or, um, you know, you could look at all the various hook knives that are out there. Um, so Mora makes some expensive ones as well. Nice. Um, I'm going to... Sorry, they, they asked about bowls too, but those are complicated questions. Bowls would be... Come take a class somewhere, anywhere. There's, you know, North House has classes. Um, there's lots of books. Um, yeah, they, uh, Danielle uh, Roseburg, Roseburg. Just, I just got her book. It's has, quite nice. It has a nice yeah. um, bowl carving book. Um, yeah. 
So there's, I'm going to double up two of these questions that are kind of related. Um, Kevin Adams is praising you guys Kevin. for your selection of classes. Uh, I was curious if there's any new classes you guys are trying to explore. And then another person asked, do you ever teach classes on making a yoke or wheelbarrow? Which I think the wheelbarrow would be really cool because you guys do have some awesome <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, um, work wheelbarrows. We trade up the classes um, very frequently to keep it um, fresh and interesting for Kenneth. And, you know, Kenneth is, is curious about so many different things that offering new and different classes is a way for Kenneth to learn new things too. So yeah, we, we constantly change up the classes. Um, anything new or interesting on the horizon? Oh. Well, um, we would like to do a longer knife class with Lucian Avery, yeah. uh, a more a more in in depth one. Yeah, the um, we did uh, our first year. We tried to uh, do a wheelbarrow making class, actually up at Dickinson's Reach, up at Bill's Homestead, um, but unfortunately we couldn't get enough people to sign up for it. But um, I would love to do another wheelbarrow class because I still have all of the bicycle wheels I got from the dump <laughs> to, to that would be, you know, hoping I could do a wheelbarrow making class uh, and the yoke making the same thing. We've tried that in the past, but um, we actually did a, it was going to be a, a yoke and then the two wood carriers. So just think like that picture of Angela, you could have the whole setup, um, but we could break that up as well. But um, anyways, I think those are, I love that making yolks is, is it's like a making a bowl with long handles, you know, that come out the end. and then you get to custom fit the inside to your shoulders. And, and we oh, use those so things fun. constantly. So, yeah, so we yeah. find them to be really useful. We'll, we'll, you I can actually to... use the yoke with the, with the wheelbarrow. Yeah, you can. Use <laughs> but we'll, I think that'll be on a, one of our, um, I'd love to teach both of those classes. Yeah, yeah. We'll give them a, a, a try. A, Send us an email. And if we get all we need are four people. Yeah, if we get four people, all for sure. All we need we get, are four yeah. people. We will teach um, something fancy. And we've we've been like our, sometimes we've offered classes that we can see aren't filling. So we'll just switch it. You know, since it's just us, we can say, oh, well, let's just, you know, even late, like almost to the summer, if there's a class that hasn't filled yet or doesn't have anybody in it, we might just, you know, try a class. So keep your eye on the um, or send us on our emails. website or yeah. send us an email. Yeah. Um, but as far as new classes go, um, uh, there's this form of woodworking called tramp art that I know I, Nate and I talked, I showed him some examples of that. It's a um, it's something I'm really uh, been interested in for a long time, actually, ever since I was in art school back in the 80s, but I've never um, I haven't worked up exactly the curriculum of how I would offer it, but that's that's something um, that I'm actively actually working on right now is how to um, make that into a class, trap art. Um, and then kind of, this could maybe be a quicker one in the vein of teaching, uh, Patty Thompson's curious, she tuned in late. Um, are you gonna teach any classes at North House, chair making classes at North House, or do you only teach that in Maine? Oh, or wow, yeah. Chair making is hard. I I uh, I different. haven't been. Uh, you know I I, I we are. I haven't. Yeah, um, no. yeah, I haven't. Not chair making probably won't happen. But I hope to teach. Um, I have some ideas about something I would like to teach at North House. The, the, uh, but it's it's still something that I haven't even gotten to the email to North House yet. So I wouldn't <laughs> want to talk about it here. But but I hope to. Yes. The copper weight chair. You could teach that at North House. Yeah, I have some other ideas yeah. too. He's yeah. got tons of ideas. <laughs> well, you have such great tools, all your chair making stuff, like everything's like top notch. A lot of vintage um, tools, stuff you can't, handmade tools that he's gotten at auctions and in Houston. Yeah. Houston and thrift stores and pawn shops. Yeah. Old Huge variety. It's like you could do it, but like the full experience is to really go and experience yeah. your. That's such a nice thing about about the school is that, you know, we have these different makers, you know, you can try a Hans Carlson set of gouges, or you can try these other ones, or you can, you know, try all the different yeah. tools out. And, you know, like axes are a perfect example. We carry five, six, seven types of axes. I don't know how people can buy one 
or decide on one without actually holding one or trying it out. And it's so great to come and try all the different axes. Yeah, we, we also, um, another advantage that some have found in coming to take a class with us is that um, some of the people that are drawn to this type of woodworking, this green woodworking, this hand tool woodworking, they're also interested in um, perhaps a more simple lifestyle. They're interested in solar. They're interested in composting toilets. They're interested in some of the lifestyle choices that we've made. So um, if people are interested in that when they come for classes, we're, we're always excited to share our experiences with that as well. Yeah, and that's um, a pretty good transition into this next question. It's from Jenny, who was curious about your guys' pump earlier. Um, she's curious, how did you guys decide on homesteading and establishing your wood school uh, in that part of Maine? Uh, Kenneth um, was offered a job at the Carpenter's Boat Shop in 2003. And uh, so we moved up here for that. Kenneth worked there for 10 years. I worked there for four or something. And um, that's that's how the yeah. Carpenter's Boat Shop brought us here. We, and the reason we chose, um, we're only about oh, yeah, it goes three, back further. We're only about three quarters of a mile away from the Carpenter's Boat Shop. Um, but this, when we were there, we were Angela and I were thinking that we would like to have our own place. They provided housing when we first started working there. It's this whole campus, you know. Nate's lived there as well, and it's a community living, but. We were thinking, we, so we started looking in the area around here for land that we could buy. And this piece that we now own came up for sale. And, and as I mentioned earlier, there's no utilities. It's a gravel road. So the, the property at that time was more affordable. Um, and we also were looking for land that we could, that I could, when I, when Angela and I were still working at the boat shop, we wanted to be close enough that we could walk or ride a bicycle. Uh, or cross country or cross country ski. ski or canoe <laughs> down, to the, <laughs> down to the boat shop. So those were some of the reasons we chose this area. But it just worked out so nicely, you know, because uh, we're for example, when we preserve. we hadn't when we we didn't know we were going to start the Maine Coast Craft School until you know around the time we started it, and um, it just turned out to be the perfect setting um, for those reasons I mentioned, and and also country workshops where, um, you know, this, our sister school where we inherited and kind of picked the torch up from them, they were so remote where they are down in um, Marshall, North Carolina, that they had to provide everything there. They had to provide three meals a day and wow. housing for everyone. And it, they told us that that was harder than running the craft school that they had down there. So when we thought about doing it here, we're not as rural as they are. And there are already established um, bed and breakfast. There's little, you know, lobster restaurants. Restaurant. Yeah. You can get a lobster or clams or whatever you want. There's, it's already sort of a place set up for people on vacation here. But it's still very rural. Yeah. So it was, we were just fortunate on many levels the way it worked out. All right, well, I think that'll do it for the evening. I'm gonna wrap up the questions. Um, Right. Thank you guys so much. Woo. And I highly recommend anyone who's able to, to go take a class at Maine Coast Craft School. You guys take a class at any teachers. craft school. Yeah. <laughs> any craft school. We think there should be craft schools in every community. Hey, Sarah. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you from North House. We really appreciate you being here and presenting during Wood Week. And um, you definitely have a lot of folks that want to come out and visit and take a class, including me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope thank you, you to everyone for being here tonight. Uh, yeah, feel free to share any last words here. Oh, it was just uh, thank you for having us and um, letting us share a little bit about ourselves. It was fun to see all of our friends in the, uh, in yeah, the audience. <laughs> No, we're just, we're, just having, we're just very fortunate to be able to do this and um, happy to be able to share it with other people. Thank you for hosting. Yeah, well, thank you again and have Bye. a great night, everyone. We appreciate it. Okay, bye, -bye. bye everyone.